Section four of the Wood Beyond the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Corrie Samuel. The Wood Beyond the World by William Morris. Chapter ten. Walter happeneth on another creature in the strange land. But as he went on through the fair and sweet land so bright and sunlitten, and he now rested and fed, the horror and fear ran off from him, and he wandered on merrily, neither did aught befall him save the coming of night, when he laid him down under a great spreading oak, with his drawn sword ready to hand, and fell asleep at once, and woke not till the sun was high. Then he arose and went on his way again and the land was no worser than yesterday. But even better it might be, the greensward more flowery, the oaks and chestnuts greater. Deer of diverse kinds he saw, and might easily have got his meat thereof, but he meddled not with them, since he had his bread, and was timorous of lighting a fire. Withal he doubted little of having some entertainment, and that might be naught evil, since even that fearful dwarf had been courteous to him after his kind and had done him good and not harm. But of the happening on the wretch and the thing, whereof the dwarf spake, he was yet somewhat afeard. After he had gone a while, and when as the summer morn was at its brightest, he saw a little way ahead a grey rock, rising up from amidst of a ring of oak-trees. So he turned thither straightway, for in this plain land he had seen no rocks heretofore and as he went he saw that there was a fountain gushing out from under the rock, which ran thence in a fair little stream. And when he had the rock, and the fountain, and the stream clear before him, lo, a child of Adam sitting beside the fountain under the shadow of the rock. He drew a little nigher, and then he saw that it was a woman, clad in green like the sward whereon she lay. She was playing with the welling out of the water, and she had trussed up her sleeves to the shoulder that she might thrust her bare arms therein. Her shoes of black leather lay on the grass beside her, and her feet and legs yet shone with the brook. Belike amidst the splashing and clatter of the water she did not hear him drawing nigh, so that he was close to her before she lifted up her face and saw him, and he beheld her, that it was the maiden of the thrice-seen pageant. She reddened when she saw him, and hastily covered up her legs with her gown-skirt, and drew down the sleeves over her arms, but otherwise stirred not. As for him, he stood still, striving to speak to her, but no word might he bring out, and his heart beat sorely. But the maiden spake to him in a clear sweet voice, wherein was now no trouble. Thou art an alien, art thou not? For I have not seen thee before. Yea, he said, I am an alien. Wilt thou be good to me? she said, and why not? I was afraid at first, for I thought it had been the king's son. I looked to see none other, for of goodly men he has been the only one here in the land this long while, till thy coming. He said, Didst thou look for my coming at about this time? Oh, nay, she said, how might I? Said Walter, I wot not, but the other man seemed to be looking for me, and knew of me, and he brought me bread to eat. She looked on him anxiously, and grew somewhat pale, as she said, What other one? Now Walter did not know what the dwarf might be to her, fellow-servant, or what not, so he would not show his loathing of him, but answered wisely, The little man in the yellow raiment. But when she heard that word, she went suddenly very pale, and leaned her head aback, and beat the air with her hands, but said presently, in a faint voice, I pray thee talk not of that one while I am by, nor even think of him if thou mayest forbear." He spake not, and she was a little while before she came to herself again. Then she opened her eyes, and looked upon Walter, and smiled kindly on him, as though to ask his pardon for having scared him. Then she rose up in her place, and stood before him, and they were nigh together, for the stream betwixt them was little. But he still looked anxiously upon her, and said, Have I hurt thee? I pray thy pardon. 
she looked on him more sweetly still, and said, O oh, nay, thou wouldst not hurt me, thou. Then she blushed very red, and he in likewise. But afterwards she turned pale, and laid a hand on her breast, and Walter cried out hastily, O oh, me, I have hurt thee again, wherein have I done amiss? In naught, in naught, she said, but I am troubled, I wot not wherefore. Some thought hath taken hold of me, and I know it not. May happen in a little while I shall know what troubles me. Now I bid thee depart from me a little, and I will abide here, and when thou comest back, it will either be that I have found it out, or not, and in either case I will tell thee. She spoke earnestly to him, but he said, How long shall I abide away? Her face was troubled as she answered him, For no long while. He smiled on her and turned away, and went a space to the other side of the oak trees, whence she was still within eyeshot. There he abode until the time seemed long to him, but he schooled himself and forbore, for he said, lest she send me away again. So he abided until again the time seemed long to him, and she called not to him, but once again he forbore to go. Then at last he arose, and his heart beat, and he trembled and he walked back again speedily, and came to the maiden who was still standing by the rock of the spring, her arms hanging down, her eyes downcast. She looked up at him as he drew nigh, and her face changed with eagerness as she said, I am glad thou art come back, though it be no long while since thy departure. Sooth to say, it was scarce half an hour in all. Nevertheless, I have been thinking many things, and thereof will I now tell thee. He said, Maiden, there is a river betwixt us, though it be no big one. Shall I not stride over, and come to thee, that we may sit down together side by side on the green grass? Nay, she said, not yet. Tarry a while, till I have told thee of matters. I must now tell thee of my thoughts in order. Her colour went and came now, and she plaited the folds of her gown with restless fingers. At last, she said, now the first thing is this, that though thou hast seen me first only within this hour, thou hast set thine heart upon me to have me for thy speech-friend and thy darling. And if this be not so, then is all my speech, yea, and all my hope, come to an end at once. Oh, yea, said Walter, even so it is. But how thou hast found this out, I wot not, since now for the first time I say it, that thou art indeed my love, and my dear, and my darling. Hush, she said, hush lest the wood have ears, and thy speech is loud. Abide, and I shall tell thee how I know it. Whether this thy love shall outlast the first time that thou holdest my body in thine arms, I wot not, nor dost thou. But sore is my hope that it may be so, for I also, though it be but scarce an hour since I set eyes on thee, have cast mine eyes on thee to have thee for my love and my darling and my speech friend. And this is how I wot that thou lovest me, my friend. Now is all this dear and joyful, and overflows my heart with sweetness. But now must I tell thee of the fear and the evil which lieth behind it. Then Walter stretched out his hands to her, and cried out, Yea, yea, but whatever evil entangle us, now we both know these two things, to wit, that thou lovest me, and I thee. Wilt thou not come hither, that I may cast mine arms about thee? and kiss thee, if not thy kind lips or thy friendly face at all, yet at least thy dear hand, yea, that I may touch thy body in some wise." She looked on him steadily, and said softly, Nay, this above all things must not be, and that it may not be is a part of the evil which entangles us. But hearken, friend, once again I tell thee, that thy voice is over loud in this wilderness fruitful of evil. Now I have told thee, indeed, of two things whereof we both wot. But next I must needs tell thee of things whereof I wot, and thou wottest not. Yet this were better, that thou pledge thy word not to touch so much as one of my hands, and that we go together a little way hence away from these tumbled stones, and sit down upon the open greensward, whereas here is cover if there be spying abroad. Again, as she spoke, she turned very pale, but Walter said, since it must be so, I pledge thee my word to thee as I love thee. 
and therewith she knelt down and did on her footgear, and then sprang lightly over the rivulet. And then the twain of them went side by side some half a furlong thence, and sat down, shadowed by the boughs of a slim quicken tree, growing up out of the greensward, whereon for a good space around was neither bush nor brake. There began the maiden to talk soberly, and said, This is what I must needs say to thee now, that thou art come into a land perilous for any one that loveth aught of good, from which, forsooth, I were fain that thou wert gotten away safely, even though I should die of longing for thee. As for myself, my peril is, in a measure, less than thine, I mean the peril of death. But, lo, thou, this iron on my foot is token that I am a thrall, and thou knowest in what wise thralls must pay for transgressions. Furthermore, of what I am, and how I came hither, time would fail me to tell, but some while, maybe, I shall tell thee. I serve an evil mistress, of whom I may say that scarce I wot if she be a woman or not, but by some creatures is she accounted for a god, and as a god is harried. And surely never god was crueler nor colder than she. Me she hateth sorely, yet if she hated me little or naught, small were the gain to me if it were her pleasure to deal hardly by me. But as things now are, and are like to be, it would not be for her pleasure, but for her pain and loss to make an end of me. Therefore, as I said e'en now, my mere life is not in peril with her, unless perchance some sudden passion get the better of her, and she slay me, and repent of it thereafter. For so it is, that if it be the least evil of her conditions that she is wanton, at least wanton she is to the letter. Many a time hath she cast the net for the catching of some goodly young man, and her latest prey, save it be thou, is the young man whom I named, when first I saw thee, by the name of the King's son. He is with us yet, and I fear him, for of late hath he wearied of her, though it is but plain truth to say of her that she is the wonder of all beauties of the world. He hath wearied of her, I say, and hath cast his eyes upon me, and if I were heedless he would betray me to the uttermost of the wrath of my mistress. For needs must I say of him, though he be a goodly man, and now fallen into thraldom, that he hath no bowels of compassion, but is a dastard, who for an hour's pleasure would undo me, and thereafter would stand by smiling and taking my mistress's pardon with good cheer, while for me would be no pardon. Seest thou, therefore, how it is with me between these two cruel fools? And moreover there are others, of whom I will not even speak to thee." And therewith she put her hands before her face, and wept, and murmured, who shall deliver me from this death in life? But Walter cried out, For what else am I come hither, I, I? And it was a near thing that he did not take her in his arms, but he remembered his pledged word, and drew back from her in terror, whereas he had an inkling of why she would not suffer it, and he wept with her. But suddenly the maid left weeping, and said in a changed voice, Friend, Whereas thou speakest of delivering me, it is more like that I shall deliver thee. And now I pray thy pardon for thus grieving thee with my grief, and that more especially because thou mayest not solace thy grief with kisses and caresses. But so it was, that for once I was smitten by the thought of the anguish of this land, and the joy of all the world besides. Therewith she caught her breath in a half-sob, but refrained her, and went on. Now, dear friend and darling, Take good heed to all that I shall say to thee, whereas thou must do after the teaching of my words. And first I deem by the monster having met thee at the gates of the land, and refreshed thee, that the mistress hath looked for thy coming, nay, by thy coming hither at all, that she hath cast her net and caught thee. Hast thou noted aught that might seem to make this more like? Said Walter, Three times in full daylight have I seen go past me the images of the monster and thee, and a glorious lady, even as if ye were alive." And therewith he told her in few words how it had gone with him since that day on the quay at Langton. She said, Then it is no longer perhaps, but certain, that thou art her latest catch, and even so I deemed from the first, and, dear friend, this is why I have not suffered thee to kiss or caress me, so sore as I longed for thee. For the mistress will have thee for her only 
and hath lured thee hither for naught else, and she is wise in wizardry, even as some deal am I. And wert thou to touch me with hand or mouth on my naked flesh, yea, or were it even my raiment, then would she scent the savour of thy love upon me, and then, though it may be she would spare thee, she would not spare me. Then was she silent a little, and seemed very downcast, and Walter held his peace from grief and confusion and helplessness, for of wizardry he knew naught. At last the maid spake again, and said, Nevertheless, we will not die readless. Now thou must look to this, that from henceforward it is thee, and not the king's son, whom she desireth, and that so much the more that she hath not set eyes on thee. Remember this, whatsoever her seeming may be to thee. Now, therefore, shall the king's son be free, though he know it not, to cast his love on whomso he will. And, in a way, I shall also be free to yea-say him. Though forsooth, so fulfilled is she with malice and spite, that even then she may turn round on me, to punish me for doing that which she would have me do. Now let me think of it. Then was she silent a good while, and spoke at last. Yea, all things are perilous, and a perilous reed I have thought of, whereof I will not tell thee as yet, so waste not the short while by asking me. At least the worst will be no worse than what shall come if we strive not against it. And now, my friend, amongst perils it is growing more and more perilous that we twain should be longer together. But I would say one thing yet, and maybe another thereafter. Thou hast cast thy love upon one who will be true to thee, whatsoever may befall, yet is she a guileful creature, and might not help it her life long, and now for thy very sake must needs be more guileful than ever before. And as for me, the guileful, my love have I cast upon a lovely man, and one true and simple, and a stout heart. But at such a pinch is he, that if he withstand all temptation, his withstanding may belike undo both him and me. Therefore swear we both of us, that by both of us shall all guile, and all falling away, be forgiven, on the day when we shall be free to love each the other as our hearts will. Walter cried out, O love, I swear it indeed, thou art my hallow, and I will swear it as on the relics of a hallow. On thy hands and thy feet I swear it. The words seemed to her a dear caress, and she laughed, and blushed, and looked full kindly on him, and then her face grew solemn, and she said, On thy life I swear it. Then she said, Now is there naught for thee to do, but to go hence straight to the golden house, which is my mistress's house, and the only house in this land, save one which I may not see, and lieth southward no long way. How she will deal with thee, I wot not. But all I have said of her, and thee, and the king's son, is true. Therefore I say to thee, be wary and cold at heart, whatsoever outward semblance thou mayest make. If thou have to yield thee to her, then yield rather late than early, so as to gain time. Yet not so late, as to seem shamed in yielding for fear's sake. Hold fast to thy life, my friend, for in warding that, thou wardest me from grief without remedy. Thou wilt see me ere long, it may be to-morrow, it may be some days hence. But forget not, that what I may do, that I am doing. Take heed also that thou pay no more heed to me, or rather less than if thou wert meeting a maiden of no account in the streets of thine own town. O oh, my love, barren is this first farewell, as was our first meeting, but surely shall there be another meeting better than the first, and the last farewell may be long and long yet. Therewith she stood up, and he knelt before her a little while without any word, and then arose and went his ways. But when he had gone a space he turned about, and saw her still standing in the same place. She stayed a moment when she saw him turn, and then herself turned about. So he departed through the fair land, and his heart was full with hope and fear as he went. CHAPTER Eleven, WALTER HAPPENETH ON THE MISTRESS It was but a little afternoon when Walter left the maid behind. He steered south by the sun, as the maid had bidden him, and went swiftly, for, as a good knight wending to battle, 
the time seemed long to him till he should meet the foe. So an hour before sunset he saw something white and gay gleaming through the boles of the oak-trees, and presently there was clear before him a most goodly house, builded of white marble, carved all about with knots and imagery, and the carven folk were all painted of their lively colours, whether it were their raiment or their flesh, and the housings wherein they stood all done with gold and fair hues. Gay were the windows of the house, and there was a pillared porch before the great door, with images betwixt the pillars, both of men and beasts, and when Walter looked up to the roof of the house he saw that it gleamed and shone, for all the tiles were of yellow metal, which he deemed to be of very gold. All this he saw as he went, and tarried not to gaze upon it, for he said, Belike there will be time for me to look on all this before I die. But he said also, that, though the house was not of the greatest, it was beyond compare of all the houses of the world. Now he entered it by the porch, and came into a hall many pillared and vaulted over, the walls painted with gold and ultramarine, the floor dark and spangled with many colours, and the windows glazed with knots and pictures. Midmost thereof was a fountain of gold, whence the water ran two ways in gold-lined runnels, spanned twice with little bridges of silver. Long was that hall, and now not very light, so that Walter was come past the fountain before he saw any folk therein. Then he looked up toward the high seat, and him seemed that great light shone thence and dazzled his eyes, and he went on a little way, and then fell on his knees, for there before him on the high seat sat that wondrous lady, whose lively image had been shown to him thrice before, and she was clad in gold and jewels, as he had erst seen her. But now she was not alone, for by her side sat a young man, goodly enough, so far as Walter might see him, and most richly clad, with a jewelled sword by his side, and a chaplet of gems on his head. They held each other by the hand, and seemed to be in dear converse together, but they spake softly, so that Walter might not hear what they said, till at last the man spake aloud to the lady, "'Seest thou not that there is a man in the hall?' "'Yea,' she said, "'I see him yonder, kneeling on his knees. Let him come nigher, and give some account of himself.' So Walter stood up and drew nigh, and stood there all shamefaced and confused, looking on those twain, and wondering at the beauty of the lady. As for the man, who was slim and black-haired and straight-featured, for all his goodliness Walter accounted him little, and no wise deemed him to look chieftain-like. Now the lady spake not to Walter any more than erst, but at last the man said, Why doest thou not kneel, as thou didst erewhile? Walter was on the point of giving him back a fierce answer, but the lady spake and said, Nay, friend, it matters not whether he kneel or stand, but he may say, if he will, what he would have of me, and wherefore he is come hither. Then spake Walter, for as wroth and ashamed as he was, Lady, I have strayed into this land, and have come to thine house as I suppose, and if I be not welcome, I may well depart straightway and seek a way out of thy land, if thou wouldst drive me thence, as well as out of thine house." Thereat the lady turned and looked on him, and when her eyes met his, he felt a pang of fear, and desire mingled, shoot through his heart. This time she spoke to him, but coldly, without either wrath or any thought of him. Newcomer, she said, I have not bidden thee hither, but here mayest thou abide a while, if thou wilt. Nevertheless, take heed that here is no king's court. There is, forsooth, a folk that serveth me, or, it may be, more than one, of whom thou wert best to know naught. Of others I have but two servants, whom thou wilt see, and the one is a strange creature, who should scare thee or scathe thee with a good will, but of a good will shall serve naught save me. The other is a woman, a thrall, of little avail, save that, being compelled, she will work woman's service for me but whom none else shall compel. Yea, but what is all this to thee, or to me that I should tell it to thee? I will not drive thee away, but if thine entertainment please thee not, make no plaint thereof to me, but depart at thy will. Now is this talk betwixt us over long, since, as thou seest, I and this king's son are in converse together. 
Art thou a king's son? Nay, lady, said Walter, I am but of the sons of merchants. It matters not, she said. Go thy ways into one of the chambers. And straightway she fell a-talking to the man who sat beside her, concerning the singing of the birds beneath her window in the morning, and of how she had bathed her that day in a pool of the woodlands, when she had been heated with hunting, and so forth, and all as if there had been none there save her and the king's son. But Walter departed all ashamed, as though he had been a poor man thrust away from a rich kinsman's door, and he said to himself that this woman was hateful, and naught love-worthy, and that she was little like to tempt him, despite all the fairness of her body. No one else he saw in the house that even. He found meat and drink duly served on a fair table, and thereafter he came on a goodly bed, and all things needful, but no child of Adam to do him service, or bid him welcome or warning. Nevertheless he ate and drank and slept, and put off thought of all these things till the morrow, all the more as he hoped to see the kind maiden some time betwixt sunrise and sunset on that new day. Chapter Twelve the wearing of four days in the wood beyond the world. He arose betimes, but found no one to greet him, neither was there any sound of folk moving within the fair house, so he but broke his fast, and then went forth and wandered amongst the trees, till he found him a stream to bathe in, and after he had washed the night off him, he lay down under a tree thereby for a while, but soon turned back toward the house lest perchance the maid should come thither, and he should miss her. It should be said that half a bow-shot from the house on that side, i.e. due north thereof, was a little hazel break, and round about it the trees were smaller of kind than the oaks and chestnuts he had passed through before, being mostly of birch and quicken-beam and young ash, with small wood betwixt them. So now he passed through the thicket, and coming to the edge thereof, beheld the lady and the king's son walking together hand in hand, full lovingly by seeming. He deemed it unmeet to draw back and hide him, so he went forth past them toward the house. The king's son scowled on him as he passed, but the lady, over whose beauteous face flickered the joyous morning smiles, took no more heed of him than if he had been one of the trees of the wood. But she had been so high and disdainful with him the evening before, that he thought little of that. The twain went on, skirting the hazel copse, and he could not choose but turn his eyes on them, so sorely did the lady's beauty draw them. Then befell another thing, for behind them the boughs of the hazels parted, and there stood that little evil thing, he or another of his kind, for he was quite unclad, save by his fell of yellowy-brown hair, and that he was girt with a leathern girdle, wherein was stuck an ugly two-edged knife. He stood upright a moment and cast his eyes at Walter, and grinned, but not as if he knew him, and scarce could Walter say whether it were the one he had seen, or another. Then he cast himself down on his belly, and fell to creeping through the long grass like a serpent, following the footsteps of the lady and her lover. And now, as he crept, Walter deemed in his loathing that the creature was liker to a ferret than aught else. He crept on marvellous swiftly, and was soon clean out of sight. But Walter stood staring after him for a while, and then lay down by the copse side, that he might watch the house and the entry thereof, for he thought, Now perchance, presently, will the kind maiden come hither to comfort me with a word or two. But hour passed by hour, and still she came not, and still he lay there, and thought of the maid, and longed for her kindness and wisdom, till he could not refrain his tears and wept for the lack of her. Then he arose, and went and sat in the porch and was very downcast of mood. But as he sat there, back comes the lady again, the king's son leading her by the hand. They entered the porch, and she passed by him so close, that the odour of her raiment filled all the air about him, and the sleekness of her side nigh touched him, so that he could not fail to note that her garments were somewhat disarrayed, and that she kept her right hand, for her left the king's son held, to her bosom to hold the cloth together there, whereas the rich raiment had been torn off from her right shoulder. As they passed by him, the king's son once more scowled on him, wordless, but even more fiercely than before, 
and again the lady heeded him naught. After they had gone on a while, he entered the hall, and found it empty from end to end, and no sound in it save the tinkling of the fountain, for there was victual set on the board. He ate and drank thereof to keep life lusty within him, and then went out again to the woodside to watch and to long, and the time hung heavy on his hands, because of the lack of the fair maiden. He was of mind not to go into the house to his rest that night, but to sleep under the boughs of the forest. But a little after sunset he saw a bright-clad image, moving amidst the carven images of the porch, and the king's son came forth, and went straight to him, and said, Thou art to enter the house, and go into thy chamber forthwith, and by no means to go forth of it betwixt sunset and sunrise. My lady will not away with thy prowling round the house in the night-tide. Therewith he turned away, and went into the house again, and Walter followed him soberly, remembering how the maid had bidden him forbear. So he went to his chamber, and slept. But amidst of the night he awoke, and deemed that he heard a voice not far off. So he crept out of his bed and peered around, lest perchance the maid had come to speak with him. But his chamber was dusk and empty. Then he went to the window and looked out and saw the moon shining bright and white upon the greensward. And, lo, the lady walking with the king's son, and he clad in thin and wanton raiment, but she in naught else, save what God had given her, of long, crispy yellow hair. Then was Walter ashamed to look on her, seeing that there was a man with her, and gat him back to his bed. But yet a long while ere he slept again, he had the image before his eyes of the fair woman on the dewy moonlit grass. The next day matters went much the same way, and the next also, save that his sorrow was increased, and he sickened sorely of hope deferred. On the fourth day also the forenoon wore as erst, but in the heat of the afternoon Walter sought to the hazel copse, and laid him down there hard by a little clearing thereof, and slept from very weariness of grief. There, after a while, he woke with words still hanging in his ears and he knew at once that it was they twain talking together. The king's son had just done his say, and now it was the lady beginning in her honey-sweet voice, low but strong, wherein even was a little of huskiness. She said, Otto, belike it were well to have a little patience, till we find out what the man is, and whence he cometh. It will always be easy to rid us of him, it is but a word to our dwarf king, and it will be done in a few minutes. Patience," said the king's son, angrily. I wot not how to have patience with him, for I can see of him that he is rude and violent and headstrong, and a low-born wily one. Forsooth he had patience enough with me the other even, when I rated him in like the dog he is, and he had no manhood to say one word to me. Soothly, as he followed after me, I had a mind to turn about and deal him a buffet on the face, to see if I could but draw one angry word from him. The lady laughed, and said, Well, Otto, I know not. That which thou deemest dastardly in him may be but prudence and wisdom, and he an alien far from his friends and nigh to his foes. Perchance we shall yet try him what he is. Meanwhile, I read thee, try him not with buffets, save he be weaponless and with bounden hands, else I deem that but a little while shalt thou be fain of thy blow. Now when Walter heard her words, and the voice wherein they were said, he might not forbear being stirred by them, and to him, all lonely there, they seemed friendly. But he lay still, and the king's son answered the lady, and said, I know not what is in thine heart concerning this runagate, that thou shouldst bemock me with his valiancy, whereof thou knowest naught. If thou deem me unworthy of thee, send me back safe to my father's country. I may look to have worship there yea, and the love of fair women belike." Therewith it seemed as if he had put forth his hand to the lady to caress her, for she said, Nay, lay not thine hand on my shoulder, for to-day and now it is not the hand of love, but of pride, and folly, and would-be mastery. Nay, neither shalt thou rise up and leave me, until thy mood is softer and kinder to me. Then was there silence betwixt them a while, and thereafter the king's son spake in a wheedling voice. 
My goddess, I pray thee pardon me, but canst thou wonder that I fear thy wearying of me, and am therefore peevish and jealous? Thou so far above the queens of the world, and I a poor youth that without thee were nothing. She answered naught, and he went on again. Was it not so, O goddess, that this man of the sons of the merchants was little heedful of thee, and thy loveliness, and thy majesty? She laughed, and said, Maybe he deemed not that he had much to gain of us, seeing thee sitting by our side, and whereas we spake to him coldly, and sternly, and disdainfully. Withal the poor youth was dazzled and shamefaced before us, that we could see in the eyes and the mien of him. Now this she spoke so kindly and sweetly, that again was Walter all stirred thereat, and it came into his mind that it might be she knew he was an eye, and hearing her, and that she spake as much for him as for the king's son. But that one answered, Lady, didst thou not see somewhat else in his eyes, to wit, that they had but of late looked on some fair woman other than thee? As for me, I deem it not so unlike that on the way to thine hall he may have fallen in with thy maid. He spoke in a faltering voice, as if shrinking from some storm that might come. And forsooth the lady's voice was changed as she answered, though there was no outward heat in it, rather it was sharp and eager and cold at once. She said, Yea, that is not ill thought of, but we may not always keep our thrall in mind. If it be so as thou deemest, we shall come to know it most like when we next fall in with her, or, if she hath been shy this time, then shall she pay the heavier for it, for we will question her by the fountain in the hall, as to what betid by the fountain of the rock. Spake the king's son, faltering yet more, Lady, were it not better to question the man himself? The maid is stout-hearted, and will not be speedily quelled into a true tale, whereas the man I deem of no account. No, no, said the lady sharply, it shall not be. Then was she silent a while, and then she said, How if the man should prove to be our master? Nay, our lady, said the king's son, thou art jesting with me, thou and thy might and thy wisdom, and all that thy wisdom may command, to be overmastered by a gangrel churl. But how if I will not have it command, king's son? said the lady. I tell thee I know thine heart, but thou knowest not mine. But be at peace, for since thou hast prayed for this woman, nay, not with thy words I wot, but with thy trembling hands, and thine anxious eyes and knitted brow, I say, since thou hast prayed for her so earnestly, she shall escape this time. But whether it will be to her gain in the long run, I misdoubt me. See thou to that, Otto, thou who hast held me in thine arms so oft. And now thou mayest depart, if thou wilt." It seemed to Walter as if the king's son were dumbfounded at her words. He answered naught, and presently he rose from the ground and went his way slowly toward the house. The lady lay there a little while, and then went her ways also, but turned away from the house toward the wood at the other end thereof, whereby Walter had first come thither. As for Walter, he was confused in mind and shaken in spirit, and withal he seemed to see guile and cruel deeds under the talk of those two, and waxed wrathful thereat. Yet he said to himself that naught might he do, but was as one bound hand and foot, till he had seen the maid again. End of section 4